Today I'm going to talk about a book that is very influential on me and it's also not super well known or popular and uh, it's A Sideways Look at Time by Jay Griffiths. It was published I think in 1999 and she has, the author, she has a very um, chaotic poetic style she does which is which is simul a lot of people find it frustrating uh let me read some of my own my own notes and if other people's reviews as well so if you go on goodreads my goodreads review was and I, I probably wrote this a few years ago um very messy incoherent self-indulgent book but it opened my mind to seeing things in a new and different way somewhat and i think that alone is always worth a five out of five stars and uh, let me read you a couple of other reviews from, from other people. Emily gave it two stars and said, Can you hear that? It's the sound of an axe grinding for almost 400 pages. I bet you didn't know that all the evils in the world can be attributed to time. I bet you didn't know that we're all going to hell in a handbasket because of watches and clocks and so forth. Yep, it's all time's fault. Villains like corporations and science and men and Christianity and industrialization and Benjamin Franklin and governments and such. Yes. They're all bad, according to Miss Griffiths. And but what do they all have in their common in their evil plotting? Time. Let's all go sit on an iceberg and look at ladybugs because time is one evil bastard. And then you know she says, uh, "I'm not saying I didn't learn anything. I learned a lot, but I really didn't enjoy it. Her research is really good and cool. I just think I may have enjoyed reading her source material more than the book." Uh, she also mentions. It takes a weird narrative turn that periodically makes me turn the page back and ask, did I miss the transition somewhere? There's a substantial amount of language that I think is supposed to be cute or poetic or cute poetic, punrific or something. But these this author's jokes sort of seem like that guest at a party who tells an off-color joke in the middle of someone's tear-jerking story about their battle with cancer. And yeah, so you can find more and more reviews like this. People say things like... Uh, this is an absolute must-read book, but I have only given it three stars for a bunch of reasons, the most striking of which is an editing failure. This book is wonderful for its content and leaves a lot desired in terms of its technical ed execution. A good editor would have resolved most of them. Um, yeah. <laughs> so, here's another one. While it's a book full of wonderful anecdotes about time, this work is largely an extraordinarily problematic fiction of misremembered history, loosely followed logic and narrow shallowness, all masquerading as broadest possible scope and deepest profundity. You don't need to be a student of history, culture, biology, or engineering to notice and overturn the author's teetering assertions and legions of straw men. Page after page, the author shares convoluted interpretations of language, symbols, and events that are more clearly and soundly the reverse of what's insisted. Um, what else? Often, when a positive reading could be made, the author instead works hard to formulate and then demand the negative. But it's worse than that. There's even examples of excruciating bias, the worst kind disguised as virtue, where the author claims that certain people, individuals, cultures, races, and genders, have superpowers that they simply don't, do not, and then insists that not only do we venerate them for this make-believe omnipotence, but that, as stated or inferred, these people are also expected to live up to such brutal expectations. Damn. In a way, this book is a glowing example of bias and pretension, pretending to be scholarship and illumination. Brutal, yeah? And you know what? Um, I don't disagree. That's the thing. That's the thing. This book is really... Um, it is not something that fits nicely along all of the other you know, works of scholarship that we have come to expect as respectable and correct and um, coherent and logical you know and, and the thing is I sense that and maybe I'm being I'm defending her a little bit too much but I sense that she is aware of that and she chooses to disregard convention anyway which is I find it refreshing I I and I, I know that a lot of people so I can't recommend this book to everybody because I know that some people are not going to be receptive to reading it because she is such a she she takes such grand leaps and she makes such uh, unqualified assertions and she's she's like a poet basically she's a poet essayist and if you kind of um, read this looking for kind of a very 
clinical rigorous analysis you're going to be super disappointed because she writes she writes like a shaman in a way you know she writes like a like a dancing pixie goddess type creature which i again i find it i found it to be so refreshingly different from everything else that i had read about this sort of thing and you know while i wouldn't write like this i i enjoy it i feel like uh, she she's she has a style that is it's just fun you know she quotes uh, john cocteau history is the truth that in the long run becomes a lie whereas myth is a lie that in the long run becomes the truth you know and it's it's just this kind of um of you know she talks about princess diana and she says like all subjects of great myths and fables diana never chose her meaning she was the silence at her own story time other voices attached meanings she was cinderella the plain little sister who became beautiful then the archbishop of canterbury called her wedding the stuff of which fairy tales are made she was sleeping beauty kissed by prince charles she was snow white at her death surrounded by seven dwarfs the paparazzi as they take her pics buried on an island she became the lady of the lake her story took all forms one day fairy tale the next iconography she was madonna queen of heaven saint and angel as the cards written in her remembrance read and you know after iconography the story became shakespearean at her westminster abbey funeral her brother earl spencer you know like a young pretender arrived from the world stage as if from nowhere and sp- spoke to the queen of england his own godmother with furious bitterness over diana's dead body um, the applauding audience the, of the world behind him and a monarch at the mercy be- at his mercy beneath his feet shakespeare memorialized in stone for the abbey's vault below that below them all would have died a second time for such a plot a story a story carved with the very stone of his own dramatic sensibility you know the narrative structure embedded in the human mind demands that the camera which created her was the camera which killed her so be it you know it's a it's very like you'll be you, when you read it you'll be like really do you really think that that's kind of you're kind of forcing it you're kind of you know being over dramatic but you know here's another one the clock is not a synonym for time but the opposite of time clocks slay time only when the clock stops does time come to life wrote faulkner in the sound and fury the west's obsessive time management ha- time measurement has gone hypertelic beyond the use of beyond the point of usefulness and the clock of the present is not the realization of time but its betrayal society begins to think in the forms it has structured for itself linear artificial over fragmented modeling itself in the image of its machinery Today ti- today's timekeeping pretends it is describing time ever more accurately when it really describes what it really describes is modernity in a telling self portrait modernity ascribes to time a driving rigidly linear impersonal coercive and dominating character overcrowded and overwound which harries its victims people you hear the screech time is running out as if that were time's fault but it is modern society itself which is overscheduled and crushingly domineering in its timings you know it's just um so she has that kind of uh, persona, you know, she's this kind of uh, almost like a street prophet saying that, you know, clocks are bad, time is time is a lie, it's a myth, it's how we've colonized our minds. And she's not wrong, you know, like you can point out how she is wrong. There's lots and lots of details that she gets wrong. You know, she talks about festivals and carnivals and, and uh, holidays and how, you know, like there used to be these these mischief nights and feasts of fools and bonfire nights and and how you know like whoever is not foolish at carnival is foolish for the rest of the year and and she talks about how you know all these kind of pagan rituals and festivals were were lively and she talks about how you know like corporations and and capitalism i guess have kind of colonized time so we know how space is colonized but like time has also been colonized and you know there's this whole bits about like railways and you know it's it, it's interesting to after you read this to go and investigate the things she talks about because she does talk about things in a very dramatic way but it's true that you know there used to be local times in every city and then when there were railways there was a need for a standardized time and here's the interesting thing that doesn't seem obvious now people w- were upset they were not they did not want to be subject to the tyranny of central time does that does that sound weird does that feel weird but it was the case you know and so there's all these things like that and and so you know 
I am currently, you know, it's now 3.45 p.m. on Thursday, the 21st of November, 2019. Why is that, right? 20, 2019 years since Jesus, since Christ. Uh, and, you know, it's a, it's a, people would say it's a work day. You know, I don't have a, I, I'm not, I'm not employed with a employer. I'm like a freelance marketing consultant right now. And, you know, the idea that someone would be right, would be making a video talking about a book in the middle of the work day, like, that's almost a little bit crazy. It's almost a little bit, irres- it feels a bit irresponsible. And these ideas are, you know, shaped by cultural expectations, by the broader, you know, so why, you know, reading this book made me start to think things like, why do we have 12 months in a year, right? Why do we have seven days in a week why do we have a five hour five day work week why do we have concepts like nine to five and you know all all of these ideas we kind of just take for granted about the way time is and the way we have to spend our we have to spend our time right the metaphors that we use and um the way just it's such a rich um mine rich vein to mine to to, to unearth all of this complexity and nuance that I think we don't have in everyday life very much anymore in modern society. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a revolutionary or, a, you know, I don't believe in, I don't believe, I love civilization. I love the internet. I love that I have a computer and a microphone and I can talk, talk to people over a camera. And, you know, I don't, I'm not a, a romantic who wants to go back to pre-modern times or whatever like that. But I think you know what Jay the gift that Jay gave me was kind of understanding that you know if you feel tired from like your daily life and your weekly life and so on it might not be your fault it might be the way that the system is engineered that is not optimized for you it's not optimized for your well-being or for your flourishing it's optimized for the system right and I think people understand this when it comes to space and you know like um People understand how colonization has an effect on people, but not so. But we don't talk so much about how our concept of time might be screwing us in some ways that may not be be optimal. And even the idea of optimal is, you know, so it's it it goes on and on. But yeah, I I'm grateful to this book because it made me expand my mind in terms of how I think about time and how I relate to time. It I think it helped me be more confident when I say things like uh, I want to be a personal historian I want to have Twitter threads and make YouTube videos and kind of be in charge or you know have an intimate relationship with time as a personal historian and with my friends and whatnot like I'm not I'm not content letting media cycles and and external events kind of dictate the the rhythms of my life Right, you can you can choose your own rhythms in a way. You can, uh, you know, you. I think what people like Jay might say is you have to I, you have to listen to the rhythms that are already there that are being kind of suppressed. So she has all these points about how you know, like we used to have seasonal foods and now like shipping and stuff allow seasons to be everywhere. And you know, if if it isn't doesn't snow at Christmas now, you might use fake snow. There's just all of that kind of, you know, idea of of this this very artificial constraint so one of the points was uh you know so the earth spins at some rate all right and so every every year or so i think the earth loses some microseconds again the phrase the earth loses some microseconds in in turning so every year it gets slightly i'm not sure if it gets slightly faster or gets slightly slower like there's a little bit more time or a bit less time and so like the earth is not sufficiently precise for man you know, like man demands that time be as precise as possible. And so how we currently measure time is something like the rate at which some molecule, some atom decays. And like, you know, when the atom decays, that, that's the amount of passage of time that is the standard time that's used globally. And, <coughs> and you know, so the, the joke there is that the earth herself is not sufficiently well behaved according to the measurements and and structures that man has imposed on time right and yeah you know there's 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 echoes of seeing like a state in this and you know when you read about architecture for example there's all these things about how oh you know we used to build 
things to our specifications. We used to build houses, you know, in, in warm countries, you build houses with high ceilings and, and big windows, tall windows, you know, so for ventilation. And there are all these things about the way people build homes and cities and towns when it's optimized for people. But, you know, modern architecture has all of these bulky kind of flat square boxes that's very it's very soul crushing in a way it's very demoralizing it's like prison right and so i think jay's point is that the way we manage our time the way we think about time the way we kind of box it up into little boxes and we have a, oh i have a nine fifteen meeting right like the way we kind of compress and 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 make things on demand is somehow psychologically unhealthy or oh, you know it's uh, you know, I'm, I'm not gonna go so far as to say it's bad for you i do think it's bad for you but i think what i would like to leave you with is just consider how your relationship with time is how do you think about time do you say that you don't have a lot of time or you know you have to spend what are you spending your time on how do you manage your time you know um, when will the time be right like just just consider and contemplate how your relationship with time has been dictated to you or how you have inherited it from the world around you and how it could be different, right? And and just being mindful of that, I think, is a very liberating feeling. So, you know, you might not be able to escape your 9 to 5 today or tomorrow, but simply knowing that that 9 to 5 was designed and imposed is, is something that I think that there's a freedom in that and and in knowing just you feel a bit less crazy i used to feel quite crazy i think and i feel a lot less crazy than i used to uh i mean crazy being uh, you get it it's, it's just it, it, i used to feel like i was i mean which isn't to say that um where am i going with this it's just it's just this sense of it is liberating that's all i guess i, I can say which is it's it's this there's a sign of relief that comes when you realize that the way you've been thinking about something has been artificially constrained in a way that it doesn't have to be and you can expand your concept of how you're thinking about anything right that's all for now